Well, today we are on the topic, Don't Reject God's Mercy. And this uh, cuts a number of different ways. There's lots of people who reject God's mercy. Some people reject God's mercy for themselves. Some people try to reject God's mercy for others. And neither one is very strategic. We're going to be looking at a story in the Gospel of John, 5th chapter, starting in verse 2. Uh, the writer says, in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, there's a pool, and this pool has five porticos, and in this area, there are many invalids, blind people, lame people, and paralyzed people. And depending on your translation, it may have verse 4 in the main part, or it may have verse 4 as a footnote. But verse 4 was is not in every manuscript. It was maybe added later as a way for the people who uh, don't know about this portico, don't know the history of it, to be able to know. And it's a helpful verse. It says that in those days, people believed that, uh, that an angel would come down and trouble the water. So when the water got stirred up, then the uh, thought was that the first person into the water would be healed. So I'd like you to picture this scene. We've got a pool, and surrounding the pool are blind people, lame people, and paralyzed people who all want to be healed, and the only person who will be healed is the first person into the water. What chance do you suppose the blind people have? Why are they there? They're there because they're desperate. They don't know what else to do with their life. They, they've got nothing productive to do with their life, so they're just hanging out, hoping that they'll get lucky and that they'll be first when everybody else wants to be first. All right, the blind, the lame. How lucky are they going to be? Well, since they're in a group of people, since the competition is blind people, lame people, and paralyzed people, everybody does have sort of an equal opportunity. But it's really kind of a desperate scene, right, of all of these people who have no hope, except that every now and then when the water gets stirred up, one person gets healed, while all of them are in a mad rush to get down there as, as fast as they can, given their conditions. It would not have been a great place to be. When Jesus arrives at the scene, he sees someone who's been lame for 38 years. One man was there who had been ill for 38 years, and so as Jesus sees him, he notices him. One of the things I've been encouraging you to do for a while is when you see someone, when you notice someone, pray into that person's life. That we notice people for a particular reason and, and, and we don't know why. But just if you notice somebody, pray for them. So I'll give you an example and then we'll talk about what if I'm wrong on this theory. So uh, a couple weeks ago, I'm driving uh, from, he from Pacific Beach to here and I get behind a uh, VW bus. It catches my attention partly because they haven't been made except in Mexico for a long, long time and because of the sh sort of shocking color of this particular bus, which would get attention no matter what sort of vehicle it was. Inside the vehicle, as best I can tell, now I'm keeping a safe distance behind and I'm only able to see the back of their heads, so I don't really know, but it looks sort of like it might be a dad and a son. Uh, the son about uh, 19 or better, 19 or college age, and the, the dad of whatever age. I'm quite a ways back, so I don't know if that's exactly what it was, but I can tell you that the driver was keeping focus, looking straight ahead, and the son was really checking out the woman in the bright orange top who was jogging with her dog. And so for all of these, uh, which I thought was funny, so for all of these things, I just noticed them. 
they went their way, I, went, I turned to try and go to my bank, and it's a left turn fr from the lane that I was in, and the traffic was flowing a little bit, and as the stop, the light turned red, the traffic flowed until it plugged up so that I couldn't make a left turn. I didn't say anything bad, but I did think bad things about those people, and then spent the, as, and so as I zoomed away, because I now had to drive, th you know, th three blocks to get back to where I needed to be, uh, I spent the time praying for the guy who cut me off. As I'm zooming through these three blocks, I get to the third block, and who do I see but this van, the VW bus. The first time, I just laughed at them. They caught my attention for a variety of reasons, and I, and I laughed. When I saw them again, I realized, I am noticing these people. I do not know why. I don't know what's going on in their life, but I started praying for them. Now, I don't know them. Maybe since we're posting this on YouTube, eventually we'll find out more of their story. Uh, but for now, all I know is it's a... And if I got somebody in trouble because of that story about the woman in the orange, I'm sorry. Uh, so, I don't know them. So let's say I'm wrong. Let's say that this whole theory is, is wrong. That when you notice people, it doesn't mean anything. But I encourage you and the whole congregation decides, yeah, let's do that. And so we all start praying for people that we notice. And heaven's just going, ugh. All of these prayers, we didn't ask for any of them. Do you suppose God's going to be disappointed? No, right? There's no loss in having some extra prayers about a few extra people in the world. Uh, especially even people we don't know. But what I think will happen is that God will continue to draw your attention to people that you may never know their story, but that need intercession in the moment. And you are the best person around. If somebody needs prayer, they're surrounded by people who don't know Jesus, don't know God, don't know God loves them, don't know that there's power in the universe that we can connect with. God's got a sorry lot, quite frankly. The 12 disciples bumbling all their way through the ministry, we're in good company. Jesus noticed this one. We don't know how many people were around that pool, but the text doesn't say anything about any of them. There were blind people there Jesus could have healed. There were lame people there and paralyzed people besides this man. Jesus came to the pool, saw the whole expanse, and noticed one person, and said to the man, do you want to be made well? It might seem an odd question to you, but if somebody's been stuck for a while, sometimes they just get used to it. There are some people who like to be ill because it gives them something to talk about. And, uh, and it's all they talk about is how they're not doing very well. And it's helpful for them to have something bad going wrong in their life. Do you want to be made well? When I was uh, in uh, CPE, which is a uh, hospital setting where hospitals get people who are going to be pastors and allow them to be chaplains for a couple weeks to a couple months as training. And in the hospital that I was assigned to, the, we were allowed to say, ask anything we wanted, say anything we wanted, but we were required to ask one question. The hospital required us, every, pa every patient we visited, to ask, why do you need this illness? Which might seem an unnerving question to you, and it did unnerve a lot of people, a lot of patients. 
but it also got many of them to think and it got many of them to get well because they they started to think why am I in this situation what has led up to it what are its causes what are the things I could do different it helped the person get more in charge of their life Jesus asked this man do you want to be made well and the man missed his opportunity the theme of this uh, message is don't reject God's mercy and we're going to see a much bigger example of that in a minute but for the man he almost missed his chance Jesus asked him do you want to be made well and his response was to give excuses why he was sick the question is straightforward do you want to be made well or not but his response was well I'm I can't I've got no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up and someone always beats me there I'm too weak I'm too helpless I don't have enough friends I'm not sure what your excuse is or what the excuse is of friends of yours but when Jesus is asking you do you want to be made well he's not asking you what your excuses are he's not asking what forces of the universe have aligned against you to cause you to be in this desperate or bad situation he's asking do you want to be better some people don't do you luckily for this man Jesus had noticed him and of all the people there Jesus noticed this one and Jesus kept on he said stand up take your mat and walk and healed the man on the spot the man got up and began walking 38 years an invalid suddenly cured happened to be a Sunday that was in a culture some of you may still remember blue laws it, this was in a culture that was way beyond blue laws they they didn't believe that you should do any work and carrying your mat qualified as work so when the man was made well and he took his mat like Jesus told him and began to walk he bumped into some good religious people who said it's the Sabbath you shouldn't be carrying around that mat one of the things that people often do is speak before they find out enough and it would be helpful sometimes if some people would ask more questions than they than they gave answers it would be helpful if these people had instead asked why are you carrying your mat and heard the story that this man had been sick for 38 years and they might have had compassion or maybe they were just rule-bound people who would have had no compassion uh, but they definitely rejected God's mercy they said it's illegal to carry a mat on the Sabbath doesn't matter that you've been healed doesn't matter that you've been sick 38 years they rejected God's mercy who told you to do this the man didn't know he said man who made me well said to me take up your mat and walk but he didn't know who Jesus was so Jesus did this miracle with someone who didn't have faith in Jesus he'd never heard of him he didn't know who he was later in the day Jesus comes to this guy finds him he says you've been made well don't sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you there's a number of ways to interpret this verse and some people interpret it uh, the Bible that I have is a study Bible one of my Bibles is a study Bible and it says that Jesus is talking about real sin and that you know it, it's you really don't want to get in trouble pull down eternal consequences I take a different tack with this I, I'm pretty sure that the worst thing that would happen to this guy is that the religious rulers would get on him and and damage his career or his family or his you know 
that they would apply a harsh penalty because he's carrying the mat on the Sabbath. So the worst thing for me, I believe, in the story that would happen to the guy is that he'd get in trouble with the authorities who have clearly no compassion and who are rejecting God's mercy. But however it is, Jesus finds him, tells him, I did tell you pick up your mat, but now you may as well honor the Sabbath. Uh, the man went away, told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. I don't know if you're this kind of person, but if I was choosing people that I wanted to heal, this wouldn't be the guy. You heal him and then he goes right to the authorities and snitches on you. I'd, seems like he's as clueless as some of the other people in the story, but for whatever reason, he goes, tells the authority, maybe he, you know, it's easy for us. We know the end of the story so that we know that these authorities that were maybe to the man just appearing inquisitive are people who will want to try to get Jesus killed. Partly for this very reason that Jesus is healing on the Sabbath. They reject God's mercy and won't see it. Uh, so it's very likely that the man was not knowing how the story played out, not realizing the people that he was talking to. The wise men went to Herod, initially. After they'd met Herod, they had some intuitive sense of what kind of desperately wicked person he was, violent, and they didn't go back, but they initially went there. The Jews started, this is the leadership, the leadership of the Jews started persecuting Jesus because he was healing on the Sabbath, and so by way of explanation, he told them what was up. He said, my father's still working and I'm still working. It's not a license for you to necessarily work on the Sabbath. When he's talking about working, he's talking about acts of compassion. The Bible is very clear that you need a Sabbath rest. It is designed for you, God's gift to you. You need a Sabbath rest. But Jesus says, on your day of rest, you don't quit having compassion. You continue to have compassion. You don't tolerate injustice on the Sabbath. My Father is still working, and I'm also working. The son can do nothing on his own, Jesus said, but only what he sees the father doing. So Jesus says, as I'm looking out, if I see God having, if I notice someone and notice God's compassion for them, I am going to help them, whatever day it is. So how to be a Christian, four easy steps. Hopefully some of you are starting to memorize this. I know some of you are starting to apply it. Talk to God about what's up, good, bad, whatever, however things are going. God loves to hear from you. God wants to hear from you. What's up? Tell, do whatever God tells you to do. Now, this requires you getting to know God's voice, which just requires some practice. Do what God tells you to do, whether it makes sense or not. Use the Bible as a filter and use uh, your sense of how things are as a filter. If you're sensing a lack of peace, that's not God. Fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. If those things are there in abundance, it's a good sign. If the opposite of those things are there, anxiety, depression, it's a clue that maybe what you're hearing isn't right. Do whatever God tells you to do, and then if you don't hear anything specific, Use the resources at hand and do what Jesus has told all of us to do. And then repeat. Tell God what's up. Do whatever God tells you to do. If you don't hear anything specific, do what Jesus has told you to do. I've had a couple of you report to me, that, at least two people report to me this week that you've tried uh, various experiments at uh, something was upset in your environment, something wasn't right, spoke to the spirit who is causing confusion in that area or disturbance or distress, it was gone. 
You have the ability to talk when there are spirits that are unseen by others and you. You have the ability to tell them what to do. Don't let them make a mess of your neighborhood. All right, time for prayer. God, thank you that Jesus, when he goes through, notices. And we ask that you help us to be finely tuned to, to what you are trying to call to our attention. As neighbors and friends uh, drive by, appear in our life, help us to notice the people that you want to be healed in the moment, the people that you want to be set free, the people that you want to know of your amazing mercy and love. Thank you for your goodness to us. We praise you. Amen.